Welcome to Breathe, a podcast series by the Africa Biodiversity Collaborative Group, that's ABCG, where we take you on a captivating journey into the world of Africa's biodiversity conservation. In this podcast, we strive to be at the forefront of biodiversity conservation efforts, delving into the intricacies of Africa's diverse ecosystems, extraordinary wildlife, and unparalleled landscapes. Our aim is to shed light on the pressing issues facing Africa's biodiversity, ignite action, and foster collaborations that bring about effective solutions. Join us as we engage with leading experts passionate conservationists and local communities who work tirelessly to safeguard Africa's natural heritage. Whether you're a nature enthusiast, scientist, policymaker, or simply curious about the environment, this podcast is tailor-made for you. Together, let's embark on a journey to understand, protect, and celebrate the immense beauty and irreplaceable natural heritage of Africa. Welcome again to Breathe. My name is Laban Cliff on Serio. In this episode, we got to interview different scientists as well as journalists during the Science Cafe. This is a platform where technical experts met with media to enhance collaboration and storytelling. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning for the Science Mesha Cafe. My name is Evelyn Namvoa. I work with the Africa Biodiversity Collaborative Group. Conservation experts met 26 journalists across Africa to answer the question, why is it important to have media and conservationists working together to make sure that people know and understand the importance of our ecosystem and biodiversity, as well as telling the African science story? Paul Gasheru from Nature Kenya is a wildlife ecologist who works as a species and sites program manager. His work entails conservation of species and their habitats through applied science and community programs to inform policy actions and conservation interventions across Kenya. He spoke to us about energy infrastructure and how it ties in with biodiversity and its effects on the ecosystem. Citing examples from both Kenya and Tanzania, he delved into the effects of the impact of development on the ecosystem. So I want to bring it to your attention. There's this small species here. It's a frog. This is an example from Tanzania. It's called the Kihansi spray toad. This frog was, um, was only found in one location within Tanzania, the Kihansi waterfall, Gorge, where Tanzania got a loan from World Bank to construct a hydro dam within that landscape. And this frog went extinct in 2009. And they have been spending so much money to bring back this frog into that landscape. So World Bank has given so much money to, to Tanzania to reintroduce this frog from zoos across the US, which had a breeding program for, for that frog to be brought back to the Kihansi Gorge. This just gives you the example that if we do not plan our investment correctly, we end up spending so much money to try and safeguard or bring back this biodiversity. And we also kill birds from globally. Kenya is in the, in the migratory routes of birds coming from Europe during the wintering periods, coming south, and now they are moving northwards. And now they'll be starting to move southwards as it becomes winter in the northern hemisphere. So therefore, energy... You know, this is a stock which was tagged in Poland. I don't know how many years, how many years back, but that was a statement which it was killed somewhere in west in in Rift Valley, the around the Nandi area. It was electrocuted, and this is a stock which comes from Poland, moving southwards. So basically, what I'm trying to em emphasize here is that our development impacts in our country are not only affecting our species, but also species that are coming. You know, it's a global it's a global discussion basically. We also caught up with Wanjoi Kabukuru, who is an award-winning international environmental and investigative journalist. He specializes on stories impacting the environment, geopolitics, business, and climate change. 
He spoke to us about journalists generating stories that are narratives of change. He tied this with how infrastructure affects the ecosystem and biodiversity. The entire business that we have as journalists is to generate stories. And these are what we call narratives of change. And what do we mean by narratives of change? Narratives of change are stories that 100% uh, discuss continually on people. They focus 100% on people and what they do, what their lives are all about, their livelihoods, and that sort of thing. And in this discussion that we are having, we are talking about, for me, uh, the topic I chose, something I know, I know very well, was infrastructure and uh, national parks. And not just national parks, but uh, also nature reserves and uh, communal reserves and that kind of thing. All these are essentially community issues, community stories. If you can capture that, if you can bring that, if you can cut across uh, the difficulties, you remove the chaff, then you will get the elements, the real diamonds in these stories. And these are wonderful headline stories that we need to go it's about uh, people at the center of infrastructure development, people at the center of nature conservation, people first. Once you get that aspect, then every other thing flows much easier. Conservation, sustainable development, is not an exclusive invitation-only club. That's Rubina James, who is the director at ABCG. Throughout her direction and leadership, she has helped facilitate ABCG's efforts to identify and address emerging and high-priority threats to biodiversity and has also encouraged ABCG members to contribute the strengths that they each bring to collaborate and improve conservation practices in Africa. At the workshop, Rubina spoke about collaboration and partnerships. And the concern I have about humanity today, we keep talking about the extinction of other species. We never look at ourselves. We are having diseases popping out of na the natural world because of our complete lack of regard and respect for it. Collaboration. This is why this was established. What was the one thing we said? Oh, oh, sorry, it's been reported badly in the newspaper because what do the journalists know? Journalists come back and say, well, we didn't know what to report and you guys are never available. That's why we're here. I can assure you, I will give you my business card and if I don't know, I'll find somebody that does. Don't be afraid to ask. I understand it can be extremely difficult because you have this, and that's why I said, it's not an exclusive club. You're invited to join. No, it's mandatory that you join. Collaboration otherwise becomes a word that I can look up on chat GPT. It becomes a word that I can find in the dictionary. If we want to talk about collaboration and we want to talk about sustainable development and we want to talk about how, how Africa or Asia or Latin America rises, this is where the buck stops. This is where the rubber hits the road. It's about us understanding what each other does, the relevance and importance of what each other does, and the fact that we can reach out because we have one common goal. And that is our very existence. Agan Daniel, the CEO of MESHA, which stands for Media for Environment, Science and Agriculture. This is an association that helps to tell the African science story. MESHA has 120 members spread out all over the country and it supports other science journalists across Africa. He spoke to us about his takeout from the Science Cafe. Basically, today we were talking about issues of conservation uh, in Africa. Uh, some of the issues that are happening, some of the things that various organizations are doing in this space. Now, what came out for me? is the fact that there's a big gap. There are a lot of things that are happening here in Africa, and there are three issues that we need to look at. One is the fact that the scientists do a lot of work, but they don't disseminate them. And so 
that basically means that uh, they have a lot of things that they interact with and they think those things are usual but those are the stories that we are looking for two i was looking at a lot of data and you see in uh, in in a program that has generated data then that basically means that there's, there's some work that is going on so what is this work and why the work and then the third thing is that um, we have journalists in the house we also had scientists in the house i hope we also had advocates in the house those three people really matter but do they know each other do they know each other's strengths do they know whom to go to if they have stories to tell or if they are writing stories so it was a sort of um, you know a forum where we were connecting with people who work in the conservation field and people who really have products to show and people who know um, the issues that need to be articulated and using the word articulation here i mean when i looked when i when i listened to the scientists there are people who have been around and they understand these issues what is still missing uh, as just as a matter of emphasis is how to regularly ensure that the journalists tell these stories in formats that fit the scientists expectations and also uh, to the uh, general users of information that is uh, what we call the common man what i would like to add is that um, telling the african science story is not an event it is a continuous thing that needs very strong relationships that uh, we must nurture and it is something that uh, we must also put resources to we caught up with other journalists who shared their thoughts about the science cafe and collaborating with scientists to tell the africa science story of change my name is tebio cheno I'm a journalist at National Newspaper. The Science Cafe having experts talk about biodiversity, talk about birds, talk about wildlife, talk about collaborative between journalists and the experts or scientists. That really opened my eyes and I felt like we are together because even when I was growing up in the industry, my first entry into the industry The biggest problem I had was understanding what scientists were communicating. It was very difficult and I I would really struggle what to write. So when we are in this science cafe and we are having uh, this scientist saying that we are here to collaborate with you, we're here to connect you with the people and even what really made it more interesting to me is when uh, one of the speakers mentioned that we want media to put people in front of their stories that when we are telling stories we have people we don't tell the stories in how people think outside there and that made me feel like for so for long we've been doing stories and scientists are wondering what are these people communicating and that really came out so well in the science cafe i really love it and my name is mike monique i'm a health and science journalist with experience of about uh, now about 20 years Uh, actually as member as major members this is uh, this is one of the best uh, areas where we found that uh, we are able to meet uh, with experts from various uh, uh, sectors in these forums it allows us as journalists to be able to tell them what we look for for stories and then we also dispel this fear that uh, you know the work of journalists is to come and blow things out of proportion i had some speakers that fear between the the the, the, the experts and the journalists with this kind of uh, science cafe you'll find that uh, the, the, the 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 fear is actually completely erased and they find that oh we do have a team of journalists whose whose expertise is dedicated to issues health and science. So my name is Emily Chebet. I'm a science, health and environment journalist at uh, Citizen TV. Um basically I've been a, a journalist for over 10 years. The beauty about doing science stories is because one so many people do not understand. So for us it is very key and especially having such events uh, meeting these uh, people the scientists and also experts for us is key because you see in the newsroom people are prioritizing political stories so getting someone to understand what climate change is especially because i was having a lot of difficulty even because i do swahili and english 
So explaining to Kenyans what climate change in Kiswahili is all about and make my mother or my grandmother understand is difficult. But since I have uh, been attending these uh, conferences, especially in, in Kigali and also Uganda, in Kenya, and even this one, every other time you grow, you meet people, they explain to you things, and you can now be able to understand better and give it in your own language. So for me, such cafes are very good. I really thank Mesha because Mesha has been very key to us and especially trainings and also connecting us to experts. Today's message was very key. Collaboration amongst ourselves and the, and the, and, and then the experts. So I think that collaboration, if we are close, I can call any person anytime, bad live. I have Wetlands International. I have everybody who can speak on a certain subject. Then we are, we are good to go. Our stories will always see the light of the day. Otherwise, we've been killing our stories every day because of lack of understanding and myself I cannot really explain well so it's becoming hard but I think going forward if we have such our stories will always be there Finally Evelyn Namvua of the ABCG group who is in charge of communications and engagement shared her takeout messages from the Science Cafe this was quite successful, the Science Cafe, and I think that it should be the beginning of many more conversations on Science Cafe to come, that we continue to nurture. this the friendship that we've developed today with our other partners, that we continue to you know, find spaces and avenues to sit together and discuss these pertinent issues that affect uh, uh, the survival of man, the survival of our wildlife, our wild places um, that we can discuss us uh, with the media and with the conservationists because we produce data, we produce information, but then um, there is need to take this information a notch higher that it can be able to influence uh, decisions, it can be able to influence policy and practice. So I, in summary, I think that there is a um, need to, for us to systematically plan for other engagements that would bring um, our colleagues from the media and even other more stakeholders to continue such conversations that we've had today. The Science Cafe has been eye-opening and very relevant because it has served as a vital bridge between the science community and journalists. When our journalists provide accurate and engaging coverage of conservation and biodiversity issues, it can lead to increased public awareness and understanding of environmental challenges. This heightened awareness often translates into greater public support for conservation efforts, including fundraising, volunteer participation, and advocacy for policy changes. Furthermore, Journalists facilitate the dissemination of crucial information about conservation projects, scientific discoveries, and success stories, amplifying their impact and encouraging more sustainable practices among the public and decision makers. Ultimately, this partnership between conservation practitioners and journalists can catalyze positive change, helping to protect and restore ecosystems wildlife and biodiversity for future generations. That concludes today's episode of Breathe. Stay tuned for more inspiring and thought-provoking discussions on our magnificent planet. Remember to subscribe, like, share and connect with us. Explore more at our website www.abcg.org Follow us on Twitter at ABCG Conserve. Connect with us on Facebook and like our pages at ABCG Conserve. Until the next episode, remember to breathe, enjoy and take care of our planet. I've been your host. My name is Laban Cliff Serio. See you again in our next episode.